Well, welcome, John Pendergrass, to this interview. You Thank are, you. again, the Joan B. Kroc Peace Scholar. You are also an expert on policy in Africa. And we're delighted to have you back here for the third year in a row. While you're here, you spend time working with our students in the classroom and in private interviews. You spend time with our faculty, working with them. You also reach out to the community in ways that will help us strategically to promote the School of Peace Studies. You have been, and still are, the co-director of the Enough Project, which is an initiative that works against genocide and different acts of inhumanity to each other. You also work for the Clinton administration, and during that time, you were Foreign Affairs Advisor for the National Security Council. You also work with the State Department. You've worked, though, with many Congress people in think tank situations and and UN and other sorts of groups that are concerned about these vital issues that preoccupy you day in and day out. You also are a counselor of youth, and you take great pride in the fact that you are a basketball coach, though I must say I can't really prove it. John, I want to ask you some questions tonight, and what I want to ask you about, first of all, is you're here at this university. You're in great demand. You could be at other universities. You're here, and you come. Why do you return year after year to this School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego? Well, the Uni University of San Diego really has invested, uh, like almost no other school in the, in the United States, in building a first-class School of Peace. It's interdisciplinary. You've somehow figured out how to create linkages in very innovative ways with nearly every department and every school on the campus. And I view peacemaking and peace building as a very comprehensive integrated process. It's not just diplomats sitting at a table, but it's a wider strategy of peace. It's, it's, a, it's a building of peace. And so when I saw a school that was investing in the same way as I was investing in peace building in my work in Africa, I said, well, this is a good is a match made in heaven. So, and it, and it turns out that the students, the, the student body from the School of Peace Studies has this kind of comprehensive and integrated view in a way that's very, very different than any other school. And I spend all my time traveling around the country, visiting universities, and this school is very unique and the students it tracks are very unique in having that holistic view of peace building and peacemaking. Oh, that's great. John, in many parts of the world, many commentators think of Africa as a basket case. Negative, you hear all the violence and bad things that are happening there, and yet we heard you give while you were here a talk on how positive you feel, not only about Africa today, but the hope for its future. Can you speak about that a little bit? Well, we, you know, we know our media, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, people want to see the gore, and, the, and so, of course, what, what we mostly see in Africa are, you know, famines and wars and HIV AIDS rates that are off the charts. What we don't see, then, is when wars are resolved. And many more wars have been resolved in the 25 years I've been working in Africa than have started. Um, most of Africa uh, is at peace. You wouldn't know that from the headlines that occasionally pop up or the television shows you occasionally see or the movies in Hollywood which glorify the violence. But you would know that uh, most of Africa is democratizing. Most of Africa is reforming its economies and trying to struggle to ensure that there are opportunities for their people. So um, the, for me, even though I work in some of the worst places in the world, in genocidal areas in Darfur and the war zones and the killing fields in eastern Congo, to me, spending time in Africa is a source of tremendous optimism because having watched over the course of this last quarter century, you know, Mandela leave prison and the apartheid system collapse in South Africa, the blood diamonds in Sierra Leone turn into a peaceful country with a democracy and, and the clean diamonds. You know, story after story of tremendous, extraordinary transformation that we simply don't see. So I think part of our job, you know, as peace builders is to tell this story and to get students, infuse them with the ideas that, these, that there are solutions to the every single problem and they can be part of that solution. Mm -hmm. John, there's many um, campaigns that our students experience. Uh, uh, many different groups like Enough come to them and, and sort of knock on their doors, try to gain their attention. And uh, how do students know what to pick, what to choose, what direction to head? Yeah, it can be like trying to drink out of a fire hose. You know, when you're a young person and you're, 
you're all about wanting to change the world and wanting to make it a better place. There's you know, 500 different causes that might at any given time attract your attention. The glitter, you, you, you run to that. And I think that the, the, the key is um, that, you, for example, everyone I know, including myself, I'm not working now on the thing that I started with, that I evolved over time and sampled and learned by experience in different campaigns and different issues and was enriched by that. So I think in first instance, don't put too much pressure on yourself at a young age to lock in on anything. Sample, look around, be part of things, practice. Jump in the water, in the, in the shallow end here, occasionally leap into the deep end, see how it feels, see the temperature. And, you know, but, but more importantly, don't stand on the sidelines. Don't be paralyzed by the number of choices. Get in the game, see how it is, and if that's not the right one that you want to work on, work on another one. It's okay. But just be, be open to the road as it sort of emerges because there are so many different paths. Take one or two, try them out. If that's not the right one, get on another one. It'll be all right. It'll work out as somehow the plan is meant to be for each and every one of our lives. Okay, so, so you'd say youth take advantage of your youth somehow. Uh, don't box yourself in. Let it, let it kind of evolve for you. And don't think that you're going to make one choice and that's it. It will evolve as yeah. it has in your life, I assume. And this is the time, you know, when you're, when you're young, you got the chance, unencumbered, to be able to take the chances. The, one of the neat things about the University of San Diego is it has the second highest percentage of, student, of the student body who are studying abroad in the entire United States of America. Mm -hmm. It's the number two school in the country. Mm -hmm. So this tells anyone who would look that this is a student body that is eager to learn about the world and taking advantage of these extraordinary opportunities that a school like University of San Diego provides and the School of Peace Studies particularly provides in terms of all the different international experiences that one could have, service opportunities, learning opportunities. You know, it just it wildly expands your horizons as a human being. And if I'm an employer and I'm sitting there looking at a, at a resume and you're, you've walked out of your school in the senior year, I'm going to be looking for people who took a different path. I'm not going to be looking at the, the sheep who come out of there with the mass process degree. I want to see somebody who's taken some initiative. So the best way you can, just one of the best ways you can distinguish yourself is by studying abroad. And, and working abroad. Another way is by getting involved in these student organizations and becoming a leader in an organization and showing that you can actually execute something, you can administer something, you can run something, you can be part of something and actually succeed. And that's the kind of thing that I think employers and, and, and people who want to, 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 to be part of something that's successful are looking for in, in a young person. You make it sound very exciting somehow, huh? Well, it is exciting, and that, part of the reason I come back is because it really infuses me because, ah, you know, I mean, this is hard work working on joint genocide, working on crimes against humanity. But when I get a chance to interact with students like these here at University of San Diego, it just, you know, it just renews me. I come out of here, you know, 20 years younger, and then, then, I, then I get older again, then I have to come uh -huh, back uh -huh. That's <laughs> roll great. the clock back. That's great. That's good. <laughs> Um, John, we've been talking about the students here. Let's go back to Africa a little bit and uh, put ourselves in the place of, of women uh, and the role that they have, uh, particularly in conflict and post-conflict situations. Uh, we have a, a great focus here at our school, as I think many places should have, is on the role of women in, again, conflict situations and post-conflict situations. Can you speak about that a little bit and what the uniqueness of that role might be? Well, you know, peace making and peace building occurs on multiple levels and as we call it multiple tracks and so there's track one and that's the, the the negotiating table and there is a concerted effort worldwide to see more women represented at the table as we all know 50 percent of the population but usually a much higher percentage of the population that is affected by war mm -hmm. and so when you have women represented in a in a track one peace process you're simply going to have more of the people's interests serviced at the negotiating table in a peace agreement. Okay. But then peace processes in the track one that we see are usually just the tip of the iceberg. There's all the work that's done by communities in, in helping to build the, uh, the relationships and the, uh, the possibilities for peace to uh, be achieved and then to be sustained. And so it's there in the in the in non as we call the non governmental organizations and the and the women's organizations the institutions that women often head or are the are the central actors right. in that are so important in long term peace building. So investing 
in building those capacity of those organizations as the University of San Diego School of Peace Studies is done, you know, where you've had these women leaders come over and doing these capacity building, the networking that goes on between women leaders so that women from Sri Lanka can learn from women in Sudan, how they do, what they do at the local level and how they contribute to peace. So it's, it's all, I think it's, it's, it's building the pyramid that at the very top we hear about, oh, a peace deal was struck. But it's all the work that these people at the grassroots level are, are, are contributing to. And I think that's where often we as, as, as non-governmental actors, whether they're schools or, or, or organizations, can, can have the most impact is mm -hmm. building those relationships and alliances with the peace builders on the ground, particularly women peace builders, because they're so crucial in building that culture of peace, building that consensus that it's time for peace in a particular society. Mm -hmm. yeah, th that leads me to, to, to another thought, uh, I, but I'd like to flip back, if I could, to our students, and I hope moving back and forth like this is not uh, confusing in any way, but our students, uh, you met them. They're, they're an exciting group of people. They're not all from the United States. They represent this year eight or nine different countries that they're from. We always have a number of internationals as part of this. But as they prepare themselves and think about going into the future, what kind of role can they have? They're not ministers of state or president or UN diplomats. What, what would you suggest for them? What kind of role can they play? Well, first of all, this is, this is the time. To, this is your training time. You know, you, you're walking, you're stepping up the ladder. So the, the time to, to learn the methodologies, to, be, to practice being a leader in, a, in an organization, uh, to contribute ideas and to debate ideas in, a, in an open way. You're, you're, you're creating methodologies. Just the other day, we were treated to a, a conference at which the keynote speaker, Bill Urey from the Harvard School of Negotiation, was uh, making the points about process that, uh, and learning over, over years uh, pro what processes work. There's so much that students can learn in, in, the, in their preparation and training for when they do have that chance to be in a position of leadership, to be in a peacemaking position. But secondly, you know, it's, there's just so much, I mean, many of them are coming from backgrounds, organizations, countries, where they have already started down a path, and they are, you know, their path is in going in this direction, heading them towards something of a great authority at some point, but they're contributing a tremendous amount along the way for the reasons we talked about earlier. Peace building, which is what this school is so much about, it happens at so many levels of society. So it's not, part, personally, I chose not to go back into government after the candidate that I supported won the election because I believe that it's just as important, just as valid in peacemaking and peace building to work in civil society, international civil society, to build the organizations and build the, the, the demand for uh, investment in peacemaking. Similarly, in these, in these other countries, and for the students here, getting a chance to uh, contribute to the institutions and organizations of civil society that demand, that create the demand for peace, whether it's in a, in a war-torn society or in a country in which the country has an opportunity to be helpful in brokering solutions and in, in mediating solutions, that demand for peace is utterly crucial. And that, ha that, that demand does not grow on trees. That demand comes from people like the students at this school working diligently in association and in networks uh, ever expanding as they are, uh, uh, creating uh, the, the counterweight to the logic of war. Well, let me press you on that though, John. Uh, uh, you, when you came through, there was no academic program like this. There was no way of sitting down systematically. There was no master's degree in development. And even more so when I began in this uh, more years ago uh, than you even began. Uh, what, maybe it's just a question of you having a charism for this, and people can't really learn into this. Why would you think that our students can sit down in a classroom and have other sorts of experience during internships and really become effective peace builders? Well, heck, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the ministries of foreign affairs and the foreign service here in the United States and elsewhere, you, you, you have uh, increasingly uh, a competitive demand for trained 
peacemakers and peace builders. It's, they're not just getting uh, you know, uh, somebody with an English literature degree who seems promising and smart. They're looking for people who have studied negotiation. They're looking for people who have participated in conflict resolution initiatives, even if they're local level. And, and they want uh, people that can step in ready to, 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 to contribute to the foreign service, uh, foreign policy objectives of any particular country. And one of those foreign policy objectives in many places is the contribution to peace building and peacemaking. So on one level, for the, and the official level, there's a demand for these people that, and where the bar is increasingly uh, higher for the kind of qualifications necessary to enter into a, a profession of being a, a peace builder or a peacemaker. Then on the civil society side, on the non-governmental side, increasingly as well, uh, there is an expectation that people will have that kind of experience. No longer does the nonprofit sector just, you know, writing little uh, airy fairy uh, uh, action alerts and uh, and papers that no one reads. They're taken seriously. They're brought in by the United Nations. There are international institu uh, uh, networks of of peace builders and peacemakers, and they contribute directly to the uh, deliberations that occur in, uh, in, in international bodies and in international peace processes. So, you know, there, there, there requires, this requires a better trained cadre of people who can contribute to these kind of things. That did not exist mm -hmm. when I started out. I mean, I could rocket up the chain because no one else was trying to get into this. Now it's a huge uh, industry of peace builders and peacemakers. That is, I mean, it's, this is very positive if it's channeled in the right way. So I think it's, it's just we, we need to, to, to ensure that people have as, as wide and deep an education as they possibly can in order to be able to be an effective actor in that new environment where the demand uh, in, in the field is for a much better trained and better and more experienced uh, person than existed a uh, quarter century or even 10 That's years good. ago. That's good response, John. And uh, just to kind of go in a really different direction, uh, let's talk about the media for a few moments. So we both know that uh, the media played a very an, uh, instrumental effect in the whole Rwanda situation where the, the radio uh, broadcast it, uh, uh, kind of an encouragement to, 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 to move toward the genocide. Uh, and that's been fairly well documented at this point. But looking at both negatively and positively, what's the role of media in conflict and post-conflict situations? Well, the, the great news is that as a result of some of the, the horrific uses of media, mass media, uh, state-controlled media, um, there is a growing uh, effort internationally to support independent media that promotes and supports peace building in local contexts. So you have a proliferation uh, of expertise now in local programming that's culturally specific that promotes uh, concepts and ideas of peace through entertainment. So you have now you have soap operas in Latin America and Asia that are focused on, in effect, peace building themes. And you have uh, all kinds of talk shows and other kinds of things that, are, that, are, that help popularize, and particularly theater is used by UNICEF and others and who are UNESCO to promote cultures of peace. So I think these are very important tools. Videos now in, this, in, the, in, the, in the day of uh, the internet, you, you, by putting on interesting programming that can uh, uh, captivate young people's attention with, uh, with some of these kind of themes, and, and you do it with, with whether it's celebrities or you do it with a creative idea or you do it with a good story, then you, know, you, can, you can reach so many more people than you ever did before. So organized, creative, constituencies of peace promoters can actually proliferate their agendas and their ideas in ways that were simply impossible a decade ago. I was really uh, amazed at how um, we used so effectively while you were here this time uh, a movie about a basketball player. Could you tell us that story a little bit? It, it makes the point and it also makes a point uh, uh, to particularly young people that might be very interested as so many young people are in athletics and sports. Could you just kind of Outline it just a little bit to give us a sense of that. Sure. One of the one of the NBA stars, one of the basketball stars, professional basketball stars in America, is a guy called Tracy McGrady, otherwise known as T Mac. You know, uh -huh. and he's here's a guy who is renowned for being uninterested in, in social issues, and, and he has a, almost a legendary in terms of his uh, self-interest. 
and he suddenly uh, decided he needed to do something, you know, that, that he was getting some kind of calling and he, so he, he realized that he had to go. And somehow we found each other and we decided to go together to, to the refugee camps for the people from Darfur. And he went and he had a life-changing experience on the ground, uh, allowed a film camera to follow him around and map his transformation. And we came back and created a program in which he recruited some of his fellow ball players and we connect schools in the United States, high schools, middle schools, and colleges with schools in the refugee camps and help build their uh, capacities uh, for, for uh, uh, providing education to every refugee kid from Darfur. And so it's been incredible and he's an ambassador basically for peace and for peace building, uh, a fellow who three years ago was completely uninterested in the world. And his transformation can be the transformation of anyone watching him on film, watching him go through his, his life-changing experience, and then a young person can watch this and, and realize that they can make a contribution to helping to change the life of a young person halfway around the world in, in such an easy way, and they can become connected to them in this program because we do the video blogging and other connections between the students here and the students there. The world suddenly becomes much smaller. Instead of learning, well, genocide is bad or refugees is a difficult situation, now they're learning about Omer or, or, or about Abdul and their, their new friend who lives in this little hut or this little tent and why is he living there and how can he go home? And so how much easier it is for a kid in Chicago or San Diego or wherever to say, well, I get it now and I want to help him go home because he's my new, you know, like I have this new pen pal or video pal. And it, it invests them in solutions in peace and be a kid watching a movie, you know, in the comfort of his home or in the school auditorium can become a peace builder just like a highly trained diplomat. And that's an amazing thing. That's the democratization of opportunity for peace in the 21st century. Thanks, John. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank Not you, only have you helped young people in different parts of the world, but you've helped our students and our faculty. You've reached out to the community here for the third year. And so as I bring this uh, interview to a close, I, I want to just say on, on this particular format or in this particular format, how much we appreciate you doing this. John Pendergrass, Joan B. Croc, Peace Scholar and Expert on Policy Efforts toward Africa. Thank you, John. Thank you, Father Hadley.